what's a fun, not safe for work history fact? Pretty much the entire Ptolemaic dynasty of Egypt. When the Ptolemies came to power in Hellenistic Egypt, they took up the trappings of the pharaohs. That included marrying and having children with their sisters. The one thing they neglected to take up was the tradition of pharaoh taking on secondary wives and mistresses. So that if the pharaoh failed to produce a healthy heir with his wife, he could just present one of his children with his other wives as his heir. Which was frequently a a problem given the massive amount of incest going on. Without this failsafe in place to inject fresh DNA into the bloodline every few generations, things went downhill quickly for the Ptolemies. By the end of the line, they were almost exclusively a bunch of blithering idiots interested pretty much in only partying at their court. Whenever they could be dragged into making a political decision, it was usually disastrous and heavily damaged Egypt domestically and on the foreign scene. The peak of this was during the reign of Ptolemy X. He married his brother's widow, Cleopatra Selene, and had a son with her, Ptolemy XI. Then he divorced her, married her daughter, his niece, Berenice III, and had Cleopatra V with her. Cleopatra V would go on to marry and have children with Ptolemy X's nephew, Ptolemy XII, and Ptolemy XI would end up marrying Berenice III. And yet, somehow, this literal clusterfuck of a family managed to produce Cleopatra VII, THE Cleopatra, who managed to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Julius Caesar politically. In medieval times, when a boy and a girl in the country of some parts of Europe wanted to get married, they needed to prove they were worthy. So, when the boy had proved he was able to provide for a family, the girl had to prove she was able to provide offspring. So, they were allowed to then make love. And when the girl got pregnant, the community made sure the boy actually married the girl. It's where the engagement comes from. During the engagement, the girl would sleep in a little room above the milk storage with a ladder against the window. So the boy was able to climb up against the ladder to make love to the girl. This was all supposed to happen all out in the open because the community had the right to know. Other boys, if they were from the same church, were also allowed to climb upstairs and fool around with the girl, so she could say goodbye to her youth. But they were supposed to stay above the blankets. This was also so the girl would prove she would not go all the way and stay faithful to her fiancé. This was called Queeston. We still have a children's song about this. It talks about this and warns what would happen if a girl would get pregnant from another boy. The child would be brought to the nuns. Grigory Rasputin was a mystic during Tsar Nicholas II's reign. He was known for curing a woman's sin of lechery by taking them to a bathhouse, stripping naked, beating the woman with a belt, having sex with her, and leaving without once entering a bath. He was eventually found to be a dangerous individual, so a plot was made to assassinate him. He was invited around someone's house to help cure the man's wife, and fed little cakes and wine laced with cyanide. After that failed to kill him, the man, can't remember his name, got his pistol and shot him point blank, went upstairs to get his co-conspirators to help remove the body. They found Rasputin had crawled out of the house and up the driveway. All the men shot him several times, then dumped Rasputin's body in the St. Petersburg River. His body was found days later with water in the lungs and his arms upwards, as if trying to escape the frozen river. He also has his penis preserved and on display in a Siberian museum. Edit. Apparently that wasn't his actual cock, and I'm not googling Rasputin's penis. A chilling man to look up. This is a really condensed summary of the man. He was... something. When the British battleship HMS Rodney was sitting in scalp of flow circa 1940, one of her stokers was starting to get a bit pent up from being out there for so long with nary a woman in sight. So he took it upon himself to have, shall we say, relations with one of the local sheep. He then got stuck. 
and had to be taken to the hospital and was then court-martialed, where he claimed, unsuccessfully, that he thought it was a woman in a duffel coat. The word spread, and thus, for the remainder of her days, every time a British ship passed by Rodney, you could hear the sounds of the ship's crew making bleeding noises at her. Didn't matter if she was just sitting in port or was going into battle, she was greeted with a chorus of baaaaaaz wherever she went. Literally, while she was chasing down Bismarck, HMS King George V's crew made sheep noises at her. They would also do this to her sister ship, HMS Nelson, to the point that she had to eventually make a fleet-wide announcement to stop making sheep noises at the flagship. A lot of people have no idea just how much of a sex fest Western Europe was when Allied soldiers came in World War II. Pretty much every unmarried young woman was expected to sleep with the soldiers, and the soldiers pretty much had unlimited access to courtless women throwing themselves at them. Unfortunately, a lot of this was coercion or even rape. Parents told their daughters this would happen to them, and they wouldn't be able to do much to stop it so they might as well just let it happen. It was basically the norm that when an army comes by, especially to liberate you, the soldiers get free play with the unmarried young women, whether they want it or not. That isn't to say that every woman who didn't want it was brutally raped. Most of these men weren't monsters, but there was a certain expectation that you had to give something to the men who freed you. The movie Fury depicts this very, very well. Operation Midnight Climax was an operation carried out by the CIA as a subproject of Project MK Ultra, the mind control research program that began in the 1950s. Operation Midnight Climax started in 1954 and consisted of a web of CIA-run safe houses in San Francisco. It was established in order to study the effects of LSD on non-consenting individuals. Prostitutes on the CIA payroll were instructed to lure clients back to the safe houses, where they were surreptitiously plied with a wide range of substances, including LSD, and monitored behind one-way glass. The prostitutes were instructed in the use of postcoital questioning to investigate whether the victims could be convinced to involuntarily reveal secrets. The victims were sometimes fed subliminal messages in attempts to induce them to involuntary actions, including criminal activity such as robbery, assault, and assassination. Many of the CIA operatives involved in the experiments voluntarily indulged in the drugs and prostitutes for recreational purposes as well. In the 10th century, Bertrand of Worms compiled a major work of canon law and penitential rules for a wide variety of sins. Within this work is a large selection devoted to various sins of witchcraft, especially related to women and superstition. Highlights include the crime of rolling around in oats and honey, baking the resultant mess into a cake to make your husband feeble and impotent, the crime of mixing period blood and or female ejaculate in to food or drink to increase your husband's ardor, and perhaps the wildest one, the crime of taking a live fish, shoving it up one's vagina, suffocating it, and then grilling it and feeding it to your husband to make him more passionate and fertile. Were any of these actual practices or just the fever dreams of monks? we can't say. But the punishment for such crimes generally involved multi-year fasts, which I guess is appropriate given the food element. Whale vomit is called ambergris. In ancient times, it was burned as incense and worth more than its weight in gold. A British king decided it tasted good enough to eat regularly. There aren't that many Egyptian mummies left around because the Romans ate them all. The Romans also didn't have toothpaste, but they wanted white teeth and discovered that urine had a cleaning effect. Old joke. You boast of having the whitest teeth, but that only means you drink the most piss. Not not safe for work, but there is a sea mollusk that produces a type of silk which can be harvested. There is an old woman in Greece who knows certain recipes to make it glitter like gold in sunlight. This sea silk is reputed to be the cloth of gold, and is a common material for high priest garments in the ancient world in Old Testament. Ambergris was a common but expensive incense for people's gods.
America's first African-American pageant queen, Vanessa L. Williams, had her crown stripped from her due to the porn magazine Penthouse reissuing some illicit photos she took years prior, just to capitalize on her win. She was able to professionally recover and become a famous actress and singer, releasing a hit album right after the scandal and having a worldwide hit with Save the Best for Last in 1992, and having famous film and TV roles such as Dr. Lee Cole in Arnold Schwarzenegger in Eraser, and Wilhelmina Slater in Ugly Betty. In a brilliant case of laser-guided karma, Penthouse would have to destroy the issue they put out, which cost Williams her win, because the centerfold was Tracy Lords, whose near-entire body of work on adult film and photography would be banned when it emerged she used a fake ID to get into the industry when she was still a minor. Alona Stoller, aka porn actress Sissy Olina, was elected to Italian Parliament in 1987. She offered to fuck Saddam Hussein to promote peace in the region. She also offered sex with Osama bin Laden to allow inspectors to check for weapons of mass destruction. She recorded songs with X-rated lyrics set to the tune of children's songs. She collaborated with artist Jeff Koons on a series of explicit sculptures and portraits of them having sex in various positions. They eventually married and had a child, but Koons left when Stoller refused to stop making porno films. Several bands have written tribute songs to her, most notably Pop Eats World. She's also seen naked on the cover of an album by Ennio Morricone. She draws a pension from the Italian government, is still involved in politics, and campaigns for same-sex marriage and the reopening of brothels in Italy. A source from within the court of Kim Il-sung, dictator of North Korea, revealed that older Kim sought the company of young preteen girls, and that there was a government division sent out to various parts of the world, especially China, to gather info about historical sexual practices that they could take home and introduce to the aging Kim. One of these was a Chinese phenomenon from ancient history, the human bed. Young girls were laid out naked in one or two layers. The source wasn't specific in this, with their thighs interlocking in a way that, according to the source, made the girls comfortable and Kim would lie in the bed of young girls and sleep every night after fornication with them. Well, not a fun fact, but neither are many of the others here, so it goes. Hitler had a plan fully mapped out known as the Madagascar Plan to exterminate the Jews, which was being discussed before using concentration camps. The outline of the plan was to put as many Jews on a ship and drop them all off on Madagascar with no food or water. In order to give them the incentive to go, it was going to be played off like Hitler was bringing them to a nice beach or something. Realizing, though, that it would take a lot of ships to bring that many people to the island, and it was likely that those those dropped off ahead of time would get suspicious as to why there was no food, water, shelter, etc. People on the boats would be reluctant to get off the boat and or take over the boat and escape. Governor Morris, one of the founders of the United States, died from an infection he acquired after inserting a whale bone into his urethra in a failed attempt to clear a urinary tract blockage via his friend and fellow founder, Rufus King. He has been long subject to a stricture in the urinary passage, and have unskillfully forced a piece of whalebone through the canal so lacerated the parts as to create a very high degree of inflammation, which has been followed by a mortification that I am told will prove fatal. Some years ago, and in the interior of our state, he performed the same operation with a flexible piece of hickory. The success on this occasion probably emboldened him to repeat the experiment. In the mid-1910s, Ford made the back seats in their cars smaller than previous years because Henry believed a larger back seat would allow for more promiscuous behavior wherever the car would be. No surprise this worked against Ford's favor later on down the line, especially as other manufacturers started popping up with better cars. And it took Ford years to realize, oh shit, my Model T isn't selling as good as it used to. Maybe my son Edsel was right about an updated car, which is the the main reason the Model A was built. Besides Ford obviously needing an updated car that didn't feel like it was designed in 1908 in a late 1920s setting. 
Much conspiracy has been made about J.P. Morgan choosing not to sail on Titanic at the last minute. But the reality was, it was his birthday week and he was having way too much fun with his French mistress. He skipped Titanic because the sex was too good and he wanted to stay. A quick extra fun fact, although Morgan died in 1913, the financial fallout from the Titanic disaster hit IMM so badly it was a massive factor in contributing to them seeking bankruptcy protection in 1915. This was astounding, coming from the company that had bailed out the entire U.S. government in 1907. So Morgan skipping Titanic got him screwed in more ways than one. King Philip V of Spain, 1683-1746, and his court liked to play a game called El Impavido, the imperturbable. Basically, a bunch of men, bottom naked, were sitting around a table which was covered by a cloth. A lady was under the table and sucked one of the men's cock. The rest of the players should guess who was being sucked. If their guess was correct, the other player had to leave the game. If it was wrong, he would leave. The game was won by the player who would come in the lady's mouth without the rest of the players noticing. And apparently the game was very popular among the French nobility in the 18th century. It is better not to tell this to the Americans. General George Patton was a Nazi and believed that the United States was fighting on the wrong side. He hated Jews, Russians, all Asian peoples. He believed that the problem of Nazism is nothing more than the problem of the opposition of Republicans and Democrats. The real threat to the world from his point of view was the yellow and red menace. He believed that it was necessary before it was too late to conclude a separate peace with Germany and fight with it against the USSR. When the war ended, he continued to make similar statements. Apparently, that's why he was killed. Locusta was a serial killer. She helped kill Emperor Claudius so Nero could be emperor. Agrippina helped, using poisonous mushrooms. So she kept killing people using poisonous plants, eventually being known as a sorceress of clandestine practices. She was later on tried for her acts by the Roman Senate. When she was found guilty, she was either raped to death by a giraffe, or she was led in chains through the city then executed. However, knowing how Rome operated, there's a massive chance it was the former, since they used animals as a means of both punishment and execution frequently. She is actually known as the very first serial killer in history. The last mainline descendant of the Medici family, Gian Gaston de Medici, spent most of the last years of his reign laying in bed being entertained by a group of handsome young men, rounded up from the streets of Florence, who performed various sexual acts in his bedroom for his entertainment. He spent so much time in his gay harem that people rumored he had died, since he never appeared in public. Eventually, he did show up in public to dismiss rumors of his death. He showed up so drunk he could barely speak, threw up twice, and then had to be physically carried back to his bedchamber. I'll have to paraphrase. President Roosevelt, or Coolidge, went to a farm with his wife as part of his job. Allegedly, Mrs. Roosevelt was given a private tour and shown a rooster who could have sex 12 times a day. 12 times a day. Maybe you could tell President Roosevelt about that, she joked. When President Roosevelt was given the same tour, he was told the same thing about the rooster and what his wife had said. Twelve times a day with the same hen, he asked. No, not with the same hen, he was told. Well, maybe you could tell Mrs. Roosevelt that, he quipped. I read that in the Palace of Versailles, it was only the royals that had commodes. All the subjects had to just piss and shit anywhere they could find, i.e. the corners of the fucking room. The place became so notoriously smelly and dirty that finally cleaners were commissioned to clean once a week. I read this on the history subreddit, so can't confirm myself, but... Uh... It boggles the mind that, even if we didn't know about harmful bacteria in feces back then, surely we would have known it was inherently dirty because the sheer stench triggers an innate repulsion in us. Vice President Nelson Rockefeller died of a heart attack at age 70 in his 25-year-old mistress's bed around two years after leaving office. Tyrion Lannister himself had plans about that ambitious, but Rockefeller actually did it. And for real. 
not just inside my television. He was somewhat pro-choice, good on environmental issues, and embraced minority hiring in state jobs, while New York governor, so that he left with 50% more black and Hispanic state employees than when he got there. They're not making Republicans like Rockefeller anymore, or Democrats for that matter. Samuel Pepys, chief secretary of the Admiralty under James II, who was responsible for much of the early modernization of the Royal Navy Admiralty, was a notorious adulterer. He kept a diary which detailed not just his work in the Admiralty and life in 17th century London, but also all his escapades. Also, apparently the Congress of Vienna, end of the Napoleonic Wars, had a lot of debauchery going on that the cloistered historians don't like to talk about. I I don't remember those details as well, though. A female orgasm wasn't seen as a sexual act, and doctors would give a pelvic massage and stimulate the clit with a vibrator, leading to an orgasm as a treatment for hysteria in the late 1800s. Oh, I don't want to spread misinformation. I've now found claims from both sides on this being both myth and true. So this history fact is either what's stated above, or someone spread some misinformation that got out, was turned into a movie, books, and was even being taught in college courses. The Americans dropped large condoms labeled small on Russian territory during the Cold War to lower their morale. Yeah, Americans had a dick comparing competition. For the longest time, I thought they actually did drop their condoms over Russia. This was an idea, but it was never executed. Also, could have been an inside joke similar to the rumors that the British had the same idea during World War II. Glad to have learned that. Also, thanks to all who upvoted. Oh, and yes, morale. Chevalier Dien was a French diplomat and spy in England and Russia. Once he retired, he revealed to the public that he had been a woman the entire time. She was henceforth made to wear gender-appropriate clothing for the rest of her life. She went on to write some books and support the American Revolution. But here's the kicker. When she died, they found out she was actually a man the whole time. He was double cross-dressing. During World War II, British condom manufacturers were contracted to provide the contraceptives to the military, particularly for use to cover rifle barrels during amphibious landings. The manufacturers were also asked about making condoms large enough to cover mortar tubes for the same purpose. Churchill approved looking into it, reportedly suggesting, and I paraphrase, we should call them British size so that if the Germans capture any of them, they will know who the real master race is. 17th century opera singer and swordmaster Julie Daubeny snuck into a coven to have sex with a nun. Then she hatched a plan involving stealing a dead nun's body and burning the fucking monastery down in order to fake her lover's death. It worked. At one time, allegedly, her femininity was contested by some guy at a party. Julie stripped topless, took her sword, dueled the guy, won, and got back to partying. Julius Caesar had sex with many women, including the mothers, sisters, and wives of anyone who insulted him. And while he was on trial for his involvement in the Catiline conspiracy, he got a letter. Cato saw this and wanted to know what it was, but Caesar refused. Cato insisted, and so Caesar read. It was a letter from Cato's sister about all the things she wanted him to do to her. Historians believe that Hitler only had one testicle due to a medical condition. After his arrest following the Beer Hall Putsch, a failed rebellion in 1923, a medical exam showed that he suffered from right side cryptorchidism, meaning his right ball sack was basically deflated. Hitler had another doctor say he was healthy and strong in the 1930s, which covered up his testicle issue. Hitler's 1923 records resurfaced at an auction back in 2010. The pure, virtuous medieval woman was expected to be a virgin on her wedding night. However, women handily had access to under-the-radar guides on how to fake virginity. One book states, The day before her marriage, let her put a leech cautiously on her labia. Then blood will flow out here and a little crust will form in that place. In having intercourse, the false virgin will bleed and deceive the man. 
Edgar Allan Poe wrote a story about four sailors being stuck at sea in a lifeboat after their ship went down. The men got so hungry they decided to sacrifice the smallest one of the group and indulged in cannibalism. Years later, the exact same thing happened in real life, and the guy who was sacrificed had the same exact name as the guy in Poe's story. Whoa. John Henning Spoke was a British explorer in the 1800s who was known for being one of the first Westerners visiting Mecca and then exploring some of Africa's largest lakes while trying to find the source of the Nile. He had syphilis for a large part of his life. While in Africa, he contracted a high fever. The fever was so high that it essentially burned the syphilis bacteria and cured him. Rasputin had a 13-inch dick. How do I know this? Remember those People's Almanac books from the late 1970s and early 1980s? My brother's history class had a handout copied from one of them, with a paragraph covered in adhesive tape before it was Xeroxed. And because we had the book, my brother became a minor celebrity at school the next day when he told everyone what was under that tape. The KGB once planned to blackmail the first Indonesian president, Soekarno by sending him Russian women disguised as flight attendants. So Akarno, infamous for his womanizer behavior, then had sex with them while KGB secretly recorded the affairs. KGB later showed him the sex tapes, and to their surprise, So Akarno was instead thrilled, and even asked for more copies to show to his people back in the country. The plan ultimately failed. The Erfurt Latrine Disaster in July 1184, Henry VI, King of Germany, who later became the Holy Roman Emperor, held court at a Hoftig in the Petersburg Citadel in Erfurt. On the morning of the 26th of July, the combined weight of the assembled nobles caused the wooden second-story floor of the building to collapse, and most of them fell through into the latrine cesspit below the ground floor in liquid excrement. This event is called Erfurter Latrinensters in several German sources. 